slow again off. Um, will focus on the presence of anti-Jewish sentiment in the child growth painting scheme. Originally, a talk on this subject was set to be presented by Miri Rubin, Professor of Medieval and Modern, Early Modern History at Queen Mary University of London, under the title, Seeing the Virgin, Seeing the Jews, Anti-Jewish Sentiment in Marie and Medieval Marian Devotion. Unfortunately, and due to circumstances beyond her control, Professor Rubin is unable to make it here today. Our planning team would like to extend our greatest thanks to Professor Rubin for her kindness and agreeing to take part in today's events when it was possible. Fortunately for us, Sarah Lipton, Professor of History at Stony Brook University in New York, has generously agreed to submit a few comments for our use today in this presentation. These comments will be noted throughout this talk, and we would also like to extend our sincere thanks to her for them. Professor Lipton has published widely on the topic of the representation of Jewish people in medieval art. Her book, Dark Mirror, The Medieval Origins of Anti-Jewish Iconography from 2014, along with her article entitled The Invention of the Jewish Nose, published for the New York Review in the same year, will be particularly referenced throughout this presentation. Let us now turn to the contents of the painting cycle. Throughout the narrative of the infancy and passion of Christ on the North Wall, the death the, of the Virgin Mary on the South, uh, Jewish people are negatively represented through derogatory characters and stereotypes. With large, hooked <coughs> noses, open mouths, yellow outfits, and pointed hats, Jewish men are depicted throughout these paintings committing shocking acts of violence. In the scene of the massacre of the innocents, rather than armor-clad men acting as on Herod's orders, hook-nosed and sneering figures intended to represent Jewish men are in shown slaughtering the young children. Later within the cycle, similar figures are shown at the arrest of Christ and later are shown to play an active role in his crucifixion. Unfortunately, this sort of representation was not unusual for the period. It was common to represent those responsible for Christ's execution as Jews due to the blame medieval Christians placed upon them for this event. On this, Professor Lipton comments that, quote, the liturgy itself, as well as many sermons and gospel story stories, insisted that Jews tormented and killed Christ, and there was a widespread tendency to connect living Jews with their long-dead forebears. In the North Wall scene showing the mocking of Christ, the Jews and Jesus, who in reality would not have looked this incredibly different, are represented with distinctly contrasting physical features. Their tongues stick out rudely, their exaggerated hats curl almost ludicrously. Switch slide, okay. And the artist's use of profile view serves to highlight there we go. Uh, serves to highlight their enlarged noses. As Sarah Lipton points out, this method was used by artists to show the Jews' willingness to look away from Christ's suffering. This same sort of depiction carries on throughout subsequent scenes representing the flagellation of Christ, seen here, and the carrying of the cross, here. We can only imagine how negatively the Jews are portrayed in the scene of the crucifixion, which no longer survives here in its entirety. The first question we will consider with regards to this subject matter is why. Why would medieval artists working right here in Child Grove choose to depict Jewish people in this derogatory manner? And where did these visual stereotypes come from? Distorted physical attributes did not appear in Western art <coughs> depictions of Jewish people until around the year 1000 CE. Before this point, scenes required labels in order to separate Jews from others in a story. As Prof Professor Lipton points out in her New York Review article, Quote, even nefarious Jewish characters, such as the priests who are urged Pilate to crucify Christ in the Egbert Psalter Codex, seen here on the screen, from around 980, uh, were visually unremarkable. They required labels to identify them as Jewish. End quote. 
Around 1100, artists began to differentiate Jews by representing them with pointed hats. Although this began as a way to distinguish respected Hebrew figures of the Old Testament, it was soon put to a different use. As Dr. Lipton has stressed within her writing, the pointed cap was not actually reflective of Jewish historical dress, but rather was an artistic creation based upon the headgear of ancient Persian priests. Nonetheless, by 1214, when the Fourth Lateran Council ordered the public differentiation of the Jewish people via the mandated wearing of these yellow caps or yellow badges, it was believed that the caps would be an imitation of what their ancestors wore. The pointed cap was subsequently seen by medieval Christians as a symbol and sign of their conception, the Christian conception of the heretical Jew. Henry III, King of England from 1207 to 1272, was actually among the first to enact this council's order. In England, Jews were made to wear yellow badges in the form of Old Testament law tablets. As elsewhere within medieval Europe, Jews in England experienced high levels of discrimination in legal, economic, and religious situations. As money lending was considered usury, or the immoral charging of interest by Christians, Jews were often left to fill this economic gap. They were also taxed at a much higher rate than their Christian neighbors, who frequently enacted pogroms against them. Tensions and violent acts against Jewish populations increased until the Edict of Expulsion in 1290, which mandated that all Jewish people leave the country of England. Around 1170, distorted physical attributes were added to the representation of Jews by Christian artists. Since classical times, exaggerated noses were often considered indicative of negative moral traits. This was taken and used by medieval Christian artists for their own purposes, and eventually became synonymous with their idea of Jewishness. As art historian Deborah Higgs Strickland notes, quote, negative interpretations were attached to enlarged or misshapen noses from antiquity onward. We know from the Little Book of Physiognomy, copies of which survived from the 13th through 15th centuries, that hooked noses signified drunkenness, voraciousness, arrogance, and wantonness and bulbous noses signify greed, foolishness, and a disregard for the future, end quote. Until the late 13th century, a variety of nasal representations were, re or, were produced in representations of Jewish men, um, including large hooked noses and those resembling pig snouts. This latter type was possibly to do with the dietary choices of Jewish people, who, had, unlike Christians, to chose to refrain from eating pork, which they saw as being unclean. It has been proposed that in a cruel twist, Christian artists used this dietary difference against them and made the Jewish people themselves appear unclean by representing them with hog snouts. It is also possible that these upturned noses were used to indicate an ape-like quality. As Sarah Lipton concisely states, by the end of the 13th century, the range of features assigned to Jews consolidated into one uh, narrow, fairly narrowly construed, simultaneously grotesque and naturalistic face, and the hooked-nosed, pointy-bearded Jewish caricature was born. As we have seen, this caricature was present throughout the childbirth sequence. Commenting upon the scheme specifically, Dr. Lipton states that, quote, Jews had been represented with distorted noses in English art starting around 1230. So it was quite common, although these murals are more consistent and insistent in showing such distortions than most contemporary works of art, end quote. As argued in my presentation earlier today, I believe that the paintings here at Chalgrove were heavily influenced by the preparatory images of the early 14th century Benlin Psalter group. Let us then take a moment to compare figures within these manuscripts to those here at Chalgrove in order to illustrate Dr. Lipton. In the Peterborough Psalter in Brussels, along with the, R the Ramsey Psalter, those tormenting Christ and leading him to his crucifixion are presented with strikingly bestial features. Their teeth are shown bared and their joints rather distorted. However, apart from the occasional use of a snout-like nose, they do not consistently bear the stereotypical traits we just discussed. Can we then be certain that just the Jews were meant to be implicated? As a few wear this winged headdress, I can go back one. That winged headdress, um, um, it is possible that the negative attributes were also given to those 
um, that were actually representations of Roman soldiers, historical players in Jesus' crucifixion. Again, quoting Higgs Strickland, quote, it has been well observed that the prominent hooked nose was a phys physical feature transferred to Jews as part of the demonization process. This is why the hooked noses so prevalent in pejorative images of Jews should not necessarily be considered only a stereotyped ethnic or Semitic feature, but rather as carrying a more general negative meaning as a sign of evil. That this same feature is also observable in images of non-Jewish negative features or figures, such as executioners and torturers of saints, when these are not meant to represent Jews, is another reason not to see an exaggerated, hooked-nosed nose solely as a mark of Jewishness. Noses provided artists with one of many points of contrast in their efforts to physically differentiate the good figures from the evil ones. In any case, it is the demonic identification that remains consistent in both form and meaning in negative images of Jews and other negative figures. In the Goth Psalter, representations of the Jews are, as those responsible for Jesus' crucifixion are much more similar to those created here at Chalgrove. Sarah Lipton's observation is made clear by these comparisons. The creators of the child group scheme placed heavy and repeated emphasis on the perceived responsibility the Jews held for the terrible events that occurred in the New Testament. Even outside of scenes presenting canonical events, the Jews are unjustly presented as disruptive and violent individuals. On the south wall, the funeral of the Virgin Mary is presented in great detail. Originally coming from early apocryphal or extra-biblical texts, uh, but here more possibly directly sourced from the 13th century golden legend, the Virgin Mary is shown praying to God that she is reunited with her son. Once her wish is fulfilled and her whole soul departs for heaven, her body is then carried to its burial place by the apostles, as we can see here in this scene. The apostles were believed to have processed with the funeral bier when it was attacked by a number of Jewish men. In the golden legend, um, this informs us that their goal was to tip the beer, burn the virgin's body, and scatter her ashes to the wind. However, as we can see in the paintings, upon touching the beer, the lead man's hand is miraculously stuck to the object containing the virgin's body. And in literary sources, we're informed that he's only released when he verbally expresses his belief both in the Virgin Mary and that her son is the son of God. We can see this conversion happening in the next scene, when um, in literary works as the high priest Jephonius is shown kneeling before St. John the Evangelist and is healed by the Virgin's Palm of Paradise. In the next scene, the high priest is shown presumably converting the members of his group to Christianity. Here, two things are particularly important to note. One, rather than negative Rather than the negative caricature of the high priest changing after his conversion, he is still represented with a stereotypical large nose and pointed beard. This brings up a couple of points. So one, for character identification, we can, can follow the same character or person throughout the scheme. But second, this brings up issues relating to medieval ideas about conversion. Are converts still seen as separate or inferior to lifelong Christians? The only other medieval representation of the scene um, still carries this same type of representation. Um, secondly, although the Virgin is dead for these proceedings, her body and her body is not physically seen. Her soul was interpreted as being very much still alive in heaven. It is important to note that she is actually the driver of these proceedings. When asked about this, Sarah Lipton stated that the relationship between Mary and devotion and anti-Jewish sentiment was, quote, very strong. For more information on the subject, she recommends Katie Inhot's Mother of Mercy, Faith of the Jews, The Virgin Mary in Anglo-Norman England, printed by Uni Princeton University Press in 2016. I would also personally recommend chapter 14 of Mary Rubin's Mother of God, entitled Mary's Miracles as Reward and Punishment. In this chapter, the relationship between medieval Marian devotion and Christian thought concerning the Jews is thoroughly explored. Especially since these images here at Child Grove were created around 30 years after the, the Jews were expelled from England, their representation in the paintings likely served as dangerous didactic, uh, a dangerous didactic function to especially young audiences. 
In Dr. Lipton's words, quote, art was very central in generating and spreading anti-Jewish ideas and feelings. She continues, the repeated visual emphasis on the distorted noses of the tormentors of Christ fed into the false and only incipient idea that Jews actually were physically different, end quote. So how should we incorporate this information into our thoughts about and future discussions of these wall paintings? Well, first off, know that this is a hugely complex subject, but there are a number of published works, such as those just mentioned, and some I'll put up on the screen in a moment, that can help us gain a better understanding. What we can do is familiarize ourselves with this history and be sure to address the negative aspects of these paintings here, along with their, of course, more glamorous aspects. When asked about their presentation to new audiences, Dr. Lipton stated that this aspect of the paintings should, quote, certainly be addressed to parish visitors. She would suggest a brochure or label that explains that the physical distortions started as visual devices to align bad figures with beasts, but that after seeing such images for several decades, people began <coughs> to assume that Jews actually did look different and so were different. So art helped create prejudice. And reflecting on the Child Grove paintings here in this building with us and the anti-Jewish sentiment they contain, some of us may be wondering how we ought to move forward with our thoughts about the scheme. Should we still appreciate them? And should we still preserve them? To this, Professor Lipton posited that, quote, yes, so long as there is ample explanation available, even the ugly history should not be erased but used to educate, end quote. She does continue with saying that this is, of course, different than removing statues from public spaces, which were erected and originally to honor people that we no longer wish to honor. So I'll leave us here on this slide with a handful of reading sources that will hopefully allow us to look at these paintings through a more broadened lens um, in the future.